Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for attending. Uh, we can go right into the next slide, Joy. So okay. good political practices. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this term. Um, our purpose today is just to present this as an overview for you, and we're going to specifically focus in on investigator responsibilities, which might um, pertain to you um, as you uh, uh, move along in your career in clinical trials and, and uh, drug development and the different aspects of clinical research. Um, there are, you know, it's kind of an overly inclusive term. Another thing I'll tell you, which may be your advantage for attending this webinar, um, there is a requirement um, for NIH funding that you have training in good clinical practices every three years. So if I were you, I would get the certificate of attendance and use this, um, <laughs> unless uh, your institution might require something else. But this, this I believe, could serve as um, proof of uh, training in good clinical practices, which would come up for various funding opportunities. Um, GCP is uh, the terminology that we use. Um, we're going to talk about this um, over in an overview, but there are several regulatory um, components that feed into good clinical practices, and they draw from various um, places. From the FDA, um, you can see there the Code of Federal Regulations and the components that feed into good clinical practices. On the bottom is the HHS regulations. Um, which is uh, the NIH side, and then over on the right is ICH, which is the International Conference of Harmonization and the different um, components that, that uh, fit into GCP. Next slide. Regulate clinical trials. Um, that it's to ensure the rights and safety and well-being of human subjects um, who participate in research and to provide useful scientific data to improve or change the standard of care. Next slide. Good clinical practices encompasses a standard for the design and conduct, performance, monitoring, auditing, recording, analysis, and reporting of clinical trials that provide assurance that the data and the reported results are credible, accurate, and that the rights, integrity, and confidentiality of the trial subjects are protected. Um, next slide. The International Conference on Harmonization, or ICH guidelines, um, the, uh, was first uh, put together in 1996. Um, and for good cl clinical practices, or GCP, we typically refer to Section E6. Um, the goal of the conference was to harmonize so that drug approval would be similarly conducted through um, the United States, Europe, and Japan. Um, in uh, 2016, there was a revision. Um, which we call um, uh, R2 or Step 4. Next slide. And the revision what resulted in amendments to encourage implementation of more efficient approaches to clinical trial design. So we looked at um, conduct, oversight, recording, and reporting while continuing to ensure human subjects' protection and um, introduced the concepts of risk-based monitoring, data integrity, and quality management so that the overall result of good clinical practices um, would lead to more credible results and uh, along with protection of human subjects. Next slide. So there are eight sections in the GCP guidelines. Um, you can see them listed here. Um, we'll go over some of these, but um, as I said, we're going to focus on the requirements for investigators because that would um, probably impact you the most. Next slide. So a couple of definitions, um, sponsor and investigator. Sponsor is any individual, company, institution, or organization which takes responsibility for the overall management of the trial. Um, and the sponsor typically focuses on the overall study objectives um, the response, and have the responsibility of reporting to the FDA and the IRB. The investigator is the person who, conduct, who is responsible for the conduct of the trial at the trial site and they focus on the subjects and implementation of the study protocol. Next slide. So a sponsor investigator, which um, some of you may very well be in that role already or um, soon to be in that role, this is the individual who both initiates and conducts alone or with others the clinical trial and under whose immediate direction the investigational product is administered to or dispensed to a subject. Um, it doesn't include any person other than that individual. So it's not the company or the agency. And there can be a lot of confusion on, as to who the sponsor is. But in this um, 
this would be the case where um, an investigator holds the IND and is actually conducting the trial. Um, and as we say here, uh, wearing both hats can be very challenging because then you have different masters that you're serving. Next slide. Um, academic trial sponsors, which um, we, if you're working outside of, you might have an industry partner, but uh, working outside of the um, uh, uh, industry and pharmaceutical industry, um, then the sponsor can take on a little bit different kind of role. So the regulatory sponsor is the person who submits the IND application to the FDA. The financial sponsor would be the funding source, so that could be NIH or an industry collaborator. And you also very well could be working with a coordinating center, um, a team that could assist an academic PI because there's often not the support at your institution um, or, you know, across a multi-center trial to do, to maintain all of the regulatory requirements. Next slide. So when do ICH guidelines apply? Um, the, these apply to any studies that are conducted in the United States where the intention is for the drug to be marketed in ICH regions, so that includes Europe and Japan, um, and, and also studies that are conducted in ICH regions which also intend to submit results to the FDA for approval in the United States. Next slide. And as we know, most multi-center trials are conducted globally, so um, many of these we partner with. Um, even within Neuronext, um, which um, I believe you're all familiar with, um, we are, especially for rare diseases, you might need to, even for very small trials, conduct trials globally to get the patient population. Next slide. These slides are a couple that show um, how we are, a, the whole clinical trial process. Um, and I think you're familiar with all this, but it's kind of in a nutshell all, all in here, you know, starting with study design, um, designing the study documents, um, selecting investigators, ethics committees, IRB reviews, getting an approval letter, um, an investigator meeting to train um, uh, investigators who are going to be involved in a study, site initiation, patient enrollment, monitoring the data, data management tasks, statistical review, and, and the final report. Um, it's kind of a nice um, graphic that shows all of those steps that go into actually, actually conducting the clinical trial. Next slide. Um, this slide depicts the drug development process, which uh, we all know is very long, but this kind of breaks it down very nicely. Um, drug discovery, and it's, you know, we can uh, debate and discuss um, how much uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry puts into development and um, uh, uh, charges for um, particular drugs, but um, it is a very long process that, that goes into um, that development piece. So two to ten years for just drug discovery and development. Preclinical work um, can take three to six years. Um, the clinical trial phase is six to seven years, and we uh, see them go through phase one, two, and three. Um, uh, to get to an efficacy trial, and then another one to two years for FDA review, and then on to manufacturing the product and distributing it for uh, purchase. Next slide. Um, th this slide talks about some of the uh, new pieces that came into the um, uh, amended um, ICH E6, um, and it particularly focuses on, so we've added in here into the um, Components of good clinical practices in red are things that came from the from the newest guidelines. Um, so for quality assurance and control, um, it's important to maintain and QA and, and QC all the systems and to use a risk-based approach to quality management. Um, you'll, you'll hear um, clinical trialists talk about risk-based approach, which as opposed to source verifying or, you know, checking everything one-to-one -to, -one to each other, is to using some statistical techniques to um, hone in on where there's a high probability of risk and then um, inducing or re introducing quality management and assessment so that um, those risks can be avoided. Um, from the CRO or the contract research organization perspective, any trial related duties and functions transferred specified in writing and uh, they have responsibility um, uh, uh, to oversee trial-related duties that are subcontracted to a CRO. 
and then medical expertise is also important. So you wouldn't want an, an orthopedist conducting a trial that involves um, uh, psychiatric uh, interventions, things like that. Next slide. So trial design and management um, are also component, um, important components in uh, good clinical practices. The trial design, um, uh, it's required that qualified individuals are involved in all stages and, uh, of the process, including the actual study design, case report form design, data analysis, study reports. Um, and, you know, it, it, this might require um, working with other individuals to get this expertise in order to assure that um, you have, you're uh, working on a good quality trial that will produce uh, quality data and an answer to the hypothesis. Trial management, data handling, record keeping, and independent data monitoring committees, they're also discussed in the um, good clinical practices. And again, you, you want to work with qualified individuals who are handling, verifying, and conducting the analysis um, when using electronic data. Um, ensure that the electronic data capture system is validated, secure, permits changes, documents changes, and maintains all SOPs um, for the system and for uh, audit trails and data and edit trails. And from the new guidelines, when using computerized systems, base validation approach on a risk assessment, maintain SOPs and ensure data integrity. These things would typically be handled by a data coordinating center, um, but it's important to be aware that these, these are um, discussed and um, mandated through good clinical practice. Next slide. Site selection and contracting is also an important uh, piece to understand if you're an investigator conducting a, a clinical trial. Um, if it's a multi-site trial, investigator selection, you want to select trained and qualified individuals and uh, think about um, in compensation to subjects and investigators um, that there should be um, indemnification provided to subjects and also establishing policies and procedures to address the cost of treatment of subjects in, in the event that there is a trial-related injury. Next slide. Regulatory submissions, um, uh, first and foremost, would be submissions to the FDA. Um, for NINDS trials, um, they require that um, an FDA submission is done at least 30 days before your grant submission, so that's an important thing uh, to remember if you, uh, you're working with an IND uh, type of trial. Um, and then also confirmation and review by the Institutional Review Board. Um, if you're working with a local IRB or a central IRB, um, there, um, there are, you know, requirements and reliance agreements and all those kinds of things, but um, as part of good clinical practices, um, you're going to need IRB approval letters and uh, name, the address, assurance number, and those types of things as part of your essential documents. Next slide. Investigational product, or IP, is what we typically refer to um, as the study drug. Um, you're going to need to uh, maintain information on the investigational product, including an updated investigator brochure, uh, which would probably come from the, um, uh, the drug partner or sponsor of uh, the study drug that's, that's under study. Um, manufacturing, supply, and handling of investigational product it includes collecting and maintaining um, the GMP or the good manufacturing product um, process uh, documents and supplying to the sites the investigational product only after all regulatory documents are collected um, and that there's actually approval for that site to be activated and to begin to um, study the drug with um, human subjects. And if blinded, there needs to be systems that ensure the study blind and also ensure timely delivery and resupply of uh, study drug product, which is a non-trivial task, we can tell you from your own experience. Next slide. GCP guidelines also um, focus in on safety, um, safety first, as we say. Um, it's um, an investigator who's involved in a clinical trial and 
conducting them with, with under GCP guidelines is responsible for ongoing safety evaluations and for promptly notifying um, investigators or institutions, um, the appropriate regulatory uh, authorities of any findings that could have adversely affect subject safety. Um, adverse drug reaction reporting, or ADRs, is um, the terminology that GCP talks about. Um, uh, we also refer to them as AEs, adverse events, SAEs. Um, you'll also hear terms like SUSARs, um, serious and unusual um, uh, suspected drug reactions. Um, all these are trying to get to whatever the investigational product is and to develop a profile and ensure safety for human subjects. Um, there's expedited reporting that's required of any adverse drug reaction that is both serious and unexpected. Unexpected would be um, not described in the um, investigative brochure or the protocol or any place like that. And uh, there's also requirements under GCP to submit safety updates and periodic reports um, uh, according to whichever regulatory agencies or uh, sponsors you're working with. Next slide. Monitoring um, has traditionally been done um, in clinical trials through on-site visits, but um, there, there is a lot of um, information now and data that supports um, risk-based monitoring and uh, quality-based um, monitoring that improves actually the accuracy of the data. So um, uh, in conducting a clinical trial under GCP, we're to ensure that the trial data are accurate, complete, and verifiable, um, that the trial was conducted in compliance with the protocol, within good clinical practices, and any other regulatory requirements. And the suggestions are from the new guidelines to develop a systematic, prioritized, risk-based approach, to develop a monitoring plan that's tailored to human subject protection and data integrity risks of the trial, and to use a variety of approaches, including on-site or centralized uh, monitoring to improve effectiveness and efficiency, to document the rationale for the monitoring strategy, and document the results of the monitoring activity. Next slide. So um, just to be aware, hopefully this isn't something that uh, you ever are required to deal with, but um, they do happen. Non-compliance um, or audits, um, uh, that are conducted uh, for noncompliance. Um, uh, if you ever become aware um, as a uh, responsible investigator of noncompliance at your own site or, uh, or at other sites that are participating, it's important to act quickly and to, um, uh, if you're an overall PI, to terminate investigators' participation. And, to, and um, more importantly, uh, to also follow up and to assure that um, there was no significant, uh, in, no uh, protection of human subjects violations or anything that impacted the integrity of the trial and to perform a root cause analysis and implement any preve preventive actions that might um, reduce that recurrence. Slide. Uh, premature, premature termination or suspension of a trial uh, is fall out from any of uh, non-compliance or any of those um, activities. Um, it, it might be also for recruitment reasons, a variety of things, but there are orderly steps that are required um, in this event. Um, and finally, the reporting requirements gets to um, uh, the final study report or clinical trial report um, to the appropriate regulatory agencies when the uh, trial is concluded. Next trial. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Multi-center trials, um, the GCP talks about ensuring that all investigators conduct trials in strict compliance with the protocol approved by the sponsor, the regulatory aid, um, authorities, and the IRB, that the case report forms are designed to capture the required data at all the multi-center trial sites, and the responsibilities of the coordinating investigator and other uh, participating investigators are documented prior to the start of the trial. All investigators are to be given instructions on following the protocol, complying with the standards, SOPs, assessments, and um, completing uh, the case report forms, and uh, that communication between investigators is facilitated so that um, the end result of the trial is, again, accurate results um, that can be reported 
um, and uh, protection of human subjects. So at this point, um, unless there's any questions right now, I'm going to hand this over to Mary Ann um, to go into more detail on investigator obligations. Mary Ann, are you muted? Thank you. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> Thanks, Dixie, for um, passing over to me and Joy for pointing out that I was muted. Um, so as Dixie said, you know, she really covered, um, you know, the beginnings of GCP and, and what some of those responsibilities are when you're acting as a, a sponsor investigator and you hold the IND application or you're running a multi-center study. Um, and what I'm going to go through now are, are some, some points about when you're acting as an investigator in a study. So um, whether it's a large study run by a pharmaceutical company or if it's a um, study that you're running as a single center study, these are all the things that you have the obligation um, to, um, to conduct the study under the principles of good clinical practice. Um, so some of these responsibilities um, are, as, as Dixie said, also really covered in this Code of Federal Regulations in, in 21, part, uh, 21 CFR, um, mostly under Part 312. Um, and so the main obligations for you as, a, as a, an investigator are to protect the rights, safety, and welfare of, of, of your participants or, or subjects that are, that are enrolled at your site. Um, that's really the number one principle guiding good clinical practice. Um, you're also, you know, required to ensure that the investigation is uh, conducted according to all the approved protocol from the protocol that was put into place as well as all of the regulations, whether they be federal from the FDA, state or local from your IRB. Um, and then the third main obligation really is about controlling the drug or the biologic or the device that's, that's being tested. Um, so, so those are really the, the, the three key things. One is safety being first, protecting patients. Um, number two is making sure you're following all the regulations, and number three is knowing what, where the drug is and, and making sure that you're controlling that. And as we say here, most of these requirements are listed on the FDA Form 1572, um, and so that's the next slide. Thank you, Joy. Um, so I know that you can't see the slide that well, um, but if you're acting as an investigator on an FDA-regulated study, you need to complete this FDA Form 1572. Um, so some of the key things that are circled on the left-hand side is um, really the name of your sub-investigator. So you, as the, the individual, you will take on the responsibility. One person can sign the 1572, and that is the person who is the PI at that individual site. Um, but you do want to list who your sub-investigators are. So if you're out for any period of time, someone else can conduct physical exams and some of these procedures on your patients when they come in. Um, and then what's listed on the right-hand side, and again, I know you can't see it, but these are a list of commitments. The next time you sign a 1572, I would really strongly suggest that you read these commitments. We'll go through some of them in the next few slides. Um, but really, I think one of our investigators um, who has done this presentation before as well um, and been through this course really um, focused on when he signed his very first 1572, he looked up every one of these regulations. Um, and it kind of scared him. It made him not want to sign the form, but he knew that he wanted to do research. Um, so really taking these responsibilities seriously is, is what we want to point to on the Form 1572 and then obviously your signature at the end. So next slide. Next slide is really just, just the you know, reminder that you know, keep calm and just take the responsibility because you're acting as an investigator at your site. Um, and you're responsible for a lot of things. So you really want to, you know, keep calm and, and take on that responsibility well. So next slide. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that very first, you know, um, the first bullet there about safety first and protecting your patients, really the, the, the safety and the, the rights of your patients and the welfare. Um, so some of the, the pieces that fall into that are providing reasonable medical care for any participants that are, that are involved in the study, um, and they may be related to the study intervention or not, you may need to be referred to someone else, so making sure that you're always taking good, reasonable medical care of your patients. Um, providing reasonable access to medical care, so depending on the type of study, the investigator may need to be available on a 24-7 basis 
um, two participants in the study, or at least they may need to have a, a contact phone number. So again, depending on um, the intensity of the study, you need to make sure that you have sub-investigators that you could also delegate this responsibility to so it's not just you. Um, you are responsible to ensure that you adhere, adhere to the protocol um, to make sure that the patients are not exposed to any unreasonable risk. So we have a couple of examples here. If you fail to follow the inclusion exclusion criteria in a study and you enroll a patient who has renal failure into a trial where they're excluding patients with renal failure, you know, specifically because their drug has some type of an effect, um, you know, that would, that would not be taking good care of your patient, right? So you really want to look at making sure you're following the protocol and you only enroll patients that meet the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, the same thing of adhering to the protocol and making sure you do all of the procedures as outlined in the protocol, um, especially things like safety measures. So if, if, you, if they're doing a CBC, if the study visit calls for a CBC to be drawn, um, this may be because the therapy in, that you're testing may have you know, different effects, things like neutropenia. So it needs to be monitored on an ongoing basis. Um, so again, adhering to that protocol is really important. Um, and also, the, it's, it's always a good practice if the, you as the investigator have a conversation with your patient and talk about informing their primary physician also about their participation in the trial um, so that people are aware that this person is on a trial. So if they start seeing a trend, they could, they could also notify you. Next slide. And I think the next slide, because it's not in presentation mode, we're going to lose some of this, but that's okay. I can talk to this. Um, so really, it's about delegating um, responsibility. Um, as I said, you want to have sub-investigators listed, but you also have to understand that as the investigator who signs the, the FDA Form 1572, you take full responsibility for everyone at your site who is acting on your behalf in conducting the trial. So um, tasks can be delegated, but responsibility cannot. So you're still ultimately responsible. So you want to make sure you have qualified individuals that are performing all of these tasks, that you're providing adequate training to everyone that you've, de made, you know, you've delegated the study protocol to, um, and also that you provide oversight. There has to be some oversight to ensure that you are monitoring what's happening with your sub-investigators, with the coordinators at your site, um, anyone else that sees that patient to make sure that they're adhering to the protocol as well. Next slide. So to speak to adequate training, you know, it's really important that the investigator, um, again, takes full responsibility for training their staff. Um, and training includes making sure that all, everyone at the site and, and on the site staff are familiar with why the study is being done. So what's the purpose of the study and, and why is this protocol important? Um, that they have an adequate understanding of the details of the protocol and the need to perform different tasks. And if there's a specific order to the task, you want to make sure that all of that is very really crystal clear to the site staff that will be performing those, those um, tasks. Um, you want to make sure that everyone at your site is aware of the regulatory requirements um, and really accepts that standard and, and is, has confirmed that they will really do everything to follow good clinical practice and protect the human subject. Um, and then you want to make sure that anyone working on the study is competent to perform whichever tasks are being delegated. So if someone's being delegated to do vital signs or an EKG, that they've been trained to do those procedures. Um, and then also you want to make sure as the investigator that anytime there's a change in the protocol or anything significant that's happened in the study, that you pull your team together and you inform them of, of those changes or upcoming changes or, or protocol differences um, at your site. Next. Talk about supervision a bit. Um, so one of the key things really um, is that you as a site investigator, you need to have sufficient time to, to conduct and also supervise your site. Um, this has been noted from, from an FDA guidance. Um, this has been noted as, as one of the key factors when they find you know, compliance issues at sites or they, they do, you know, an FDA comes in and does an audit. This is a, a factor that they really identified is that investigators oftentimes um, don't have the, the ability to, to oversee everything at their site. And sometimes the things that, that, um, that, that cause this is that they, they don't have enough time. They have inexperienced study staff that maybe they haven't trained well. 
um, it's, or they've delegated too much work to their study staff, so the study staff doesn't isn't able to conduct all of those um, procedures in, in the right way, um, especially when you're talking about complex trials um, and large, if you're trying to enroll a large number of subjects at your site um, and you're working with a very sick patient population, um, and, and some, sometimes, you know, this happens very, very randomly, but, but or very rarely, but occasionally we have investigators that work at multiple sites and they're conducting studies at, from a remote location, and that's really challenging to do. So, again, when you take on the role of, an, of a site investigator, you have to think about, do you have all of the resources and do you have the time to be able to work with your staff and properly train them and, and delegate responsibilities? Next slide. So in terms of supervision, and this is just sort of some, some tips and tricks of being able to have a, a plan to supervise your staff. So one of those is really by having routine meetings with the study staff, so you can talk about progress of the trial, if there are any updates, if there have been adverse events, um, or any other protocol deviations that you want to talk about at your, at your staff meeting. Um, you also want to document those staff meetings because that, that is, is good practice. Um, you also want to make sure that you, you're documenting the performance of the delegated tasks. So you want to review your delegation logs. You want to review and make sure that the proper people are, are delegated tasks. And again, document that you've done that on a regular basis. Um, you also want to have a procedure in place for a couple of things, right? For, for ensuring that consenting is done properly. So how are you consenting patients? Who is consenting the patient? Um, is there some type of a checklist that they've, that they've completed all of the, the um, required elements of the consent? Um, and also writing a consent note um, to note that you've you know, reviewed everything, answered all of the patient's questions, um, provided them with a copy of the consent form, um, you also don't want to have some procedures for ensuring that source data um, are both accurate, updated, and original. Um, and you want to review that. This time, this often happens at an investigator level when you have a monitoring visit, um, and you want to be, be able to make sure you're meeting with the monitor and, and hearing how is your staff doing with data entry. Um, it's a really key piece of the study and, and sometimes gets overlooked. Um, and what they're looking at is matching really what's in the source, what's in your source documents, and making sure that that is what's entered into the study database. Um, that can give you a clue as to whether your staff has needs more training or maybe has a, too much of a workload. The monitor is a really good source of information for that. Um, and you also need to have a procedure in place for addressing any medical or ethical issues that might come up. So making sure that you're keeping the, the sponsor informed of, of all of these um, issues that may arise, letting your IRB know about those, and maybe talking to the medical monitor if there's a, a medical monitor assigned to the study as well at the sponsor level. Next slide. So in case we haven't scared you off already with this presentation, um, really what we're just trying to say is you as the investigator, you can delegate tasks, but again, you are fully responsible um, for completing those tasks or making sure that they are complete and that, that, that all of them have been done under the, under the regulations that are required and under good clinical practice guidelines. So next slide. Um, so site selection. When you're chosen, when you're asked to, to fill out a site selection or site feasibility questionnaire from, you know, someone that's conducting a study, whether it be an academic study or an industry-sponsored study, um, Typically, they send you a questionnaire. Um, they want to know how many, you know, how many patients you have in your clinic, um, how many patients might meet the inclusion exclusion criteria for the particular trial, um, what are your IRB processes and timelines, um, what are your contract timeline, that's a big question, um, and what type of experience yourself and your site has. Um, so it's really important to give accurate information on these. Um, you know, I think, in, as Dixie said, you know, we, we lead the Neuronex network. We really find it very important, and we do look back at, at things after a trial is conducted to see how accurate were people in, at um, really trying to fill out these site selection or site feasibility questionnaires. It's important because if you're chosen as a site, you're going to be held to certain standards in most trials. So you want to make sure that you're accurate, that you give reasonable estimates of how many patients you can enroll because 
people are, are you know, basing their timelines on that. So it's really important that you try to be as accurate on these forms as possible and also to sort of respond in a timely fashion if you want to be selected to participate in the trial. Next slide. Once you're selected in a, in, in a study, um, to participate in a study, you're going to go through many processes. Um, so the first one is you're going to get a clinical trial agreement, um, and it usually takes three to six months really to for most sites to, to get a fully executed contract. Um, anything you can do at an investor level to speed that up is always appreciated. Um, from the IRB, whether you're using your own local IRB or whether there's an, a, a central IRB of record, um, doing all the processes of submitting the protocol, the consent form, and any other materials that need to be reviewed by the IRB, um, that typically takes, again, somewhere between four to six months uh, in most studies. Um, there are a lot of other things you need to do before your site can begin enrolling patients. Um, so you need to sign off on the protocol and sometimes on the investigator's brochure that you are signing to say that you will follow this protocol and that you've read the investigator's brochure. Um, you're going to sign and date that 1572 that I talked about a little bit earlier that's scary and you're going to read over those commitments. Um, you're going to make sure that you have a, um, filled out the financial disclosure forms for yourself as well as anyone else that's listed on the 1572. Um, your, whether it be the coordination center or a sponsor will typically want to know your IRB membership list. They'll want to have a copy um, of your human protection, um, protection of human subjects training certification. Um, they'll also want to ensure that you've been trained, that it's the sponsor's responsibility to make sure that you're trained in the protocol, the outcome measures, the electronic data capture system. Um, so making sure that they'll train you on those and then provide some type of certification. Um, investigators typically do that training at an investigator meeting. Um, and then finally, you would have typically a site initiation visit. Many times these are done via webinar where um, we just review all of the, um, uh, the, the high-level items and answer any questions before we activate a site um, to begin enrolling patients. Next slide. So now you're open for enrollment. Um, you've made it through your, your site activation checklist. Um, so now you really want to think about what are your recruitment tools um, and making sure that you remember that anything that you're going to give to a patient or send to a patient needs to be IRB approved. Um, it has to be approved, again, whether it be your local IRB, if, it's, if you're under the local IRB review, or if you're doing this centrally. Um, so sometimes people send letters, they have websites or web notifications. Um, even if you're going to be searching your internal um, patient databases, you need to ensure that the IRB has approved you to do that. Um, consenting. You want to make sure that, again, you, you have a good process for consenting. You know who is consenting. Um, you make sure that you explain to the participants um, information about why you're conducting the trial, what's going to happen to them during the trial, sort of how many hours they're going to need to be available and how many visits they'll need to be coming in for. Um, what are the risks? If there's a risk-benefit ratio that would be discussed, um, and who's conducting that research, so, and, and who do they contact if they have questions. Um, consenting is an ongoing process. It's not a one-time signing of a form. Um, it's very important, though, to have that signed form um, and to date and time that and also provide a copy to the participant. Um, we often always say, you know, it's good to have a note that describes what your process is for consenting. Um, once you've consented, once the participant has consented to, to move forward in the trial, then you begin going through the screening and randomization process. Um, there's typically an eligibility checklist to make sure that the patient is eligible. Um, and once the, the, you as the investigator have all of the data back, whether they need to have labs drawn or other things that would um, uh, confirm that they're eligible for a study, once you have all of that data, you would sign off on an eligibility checklist. Um, and then for a randomization as well, you would, you would make a note that this patient passed all of their eligibility and they are um, moving forward with randomization. And that's also signed by the investigator. Next slide. Moving into your follow-up visits. So, so for every patient that you know, comes in and signs a consent and gets randomized, um, you're going to be following them up based on the schedule of activities that's in the protocol. 
Uh, you want to ensure that you um, are conducting those visits within window, so the windows are there for a reason. You want to make sure that you're completing all of the assessments that were written in the protocol. Um, again, really safety is first. You want to make sure that you're documenting the labs and reviewing your labs to see if there's anything that's, that's abnormal um, and clinically significant. You want to be monitoring your patients for any adverse events that may happen or serious adverse events. You also want to note any protocol deviations that, are, that are, have occurred uh, and make sure those get reported properly. You want to pr um, get guidance from the protocol. The protocol is sort of where you go to, to to know what needs to be done at each study visit. Um, the investigators brochure will give you, you know, really important information about the drug. Um, and you can also reach out to your study monitor or sponsor um, with any questions you might have. Um, your source documentation and your CRFs, you know, need to be clear and clean. It's really the most important thing on this slide is that one in the middle that says if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So if it's not written down somewhere and it can't be attributable, um, then that then the visit never happens. Nothing happened. So it's really important to, to have your source documentation be very clear. Um, again, during your follow-up visits and after your follow-up visits, you always want to make sure that you're you know keeping up to date with your data entry. If you've had a serious adverse event, that needs to be reported in an expedited fashion to the sponsor. So it needs to be entered into the database very quickly. Um, typically within 24 hours, because they have reporting responsibility to, to the FDA. Um, monitoring visits will go on. Again, the monitors will come to your sites, whether they do this remotely or they come on site. Um, make sure that you're prepared to meet with them, that you address the issues with them. Um, you listen to their feedback about what's happening at your site. Um, they're, really, they're really there to protect you and, and help you and help your site. Um, and then follow up on any act, any action items that come out of the monitoring visit and use that as a tool to sort of work with your staff and help supervise your staff. Um, and it's always a good idea to keep your grant manager in the loop as well when you're thinking about getting paid for your study visits and anything else that, that might occur. Um, next slide. So we've talked a little bit about adverse events. Sixty mentioned in hers. I've talked about it a little bit. Um, so this really... Um, just gives a regulatory definition of an adverse event. It's any untoward medical occurrences associated with the use of a drug in humans, whether or not it's related to the drug. Um, it's just an, an adverse event. Um, and so we want to make sure that you're always asking participants, you know, if they've had any adverse events. Um, sometimes they're, they will volunteer this information. Sometimes they need to be prompted. You may see um, an adverse event in their labs. You'll see some clinically um, significant abnormal labs, or you'll find something on the physical exam that needs to be noted as an adverse event. Um, different sponsors code adverse events in different ways. So you want to go back to your sponsor and your protocol as to how you should be reporting those adverse events. Um, and so all of the things here, so the date that it occurred, when it began, when it was resolved, the severity, all of these things will be in the um, uh, in your protocol. And again, your sponsor will give you specific instructions on that per protocol. Next slide. Serious adverse events. So these are, again, a very specific regulatory definition um, of the serious adverse event is you know, it has to meet one of the criteria. So it has to be death, it has to be life-threatening, which means the case participant was really at immediate risk of death. Um, they're, if the patient is hospitalized or if they have a prolonged hospitalization, if there's persistent or significant um, inability to conduct normal life functions, um, if, there's, if there's a pregnancy that results in a congenital anomaly or a birth defect, that's a serious adverse event. Um, and then there's the last category, which is really anything that's an important medical event um, that can be classified as a, as a serious adverse event. And that's really to your judgment as the investigator. Um, it may be something like, you know, something that requires emergency room treatment of some severe allergic reaction um, that they don't actually get admitted for. So it's not technically a hospitalization, but you may want to record that as a serious adverse event, and you can certainly do that. Um, and again, as I said before, you know, you, you need to really report serious adverse events to the sponsor very quickly. Typically, it's within 24 hours. Um, you also need to report that to your site IRB um, or the IRB of record for the trial. And again, the rules, that would be specific to your study. 
Um, and then you need to follow up on those serious adverse events as well and, and conduct follow up. Next. So this is, you know, again, just reviewing, you know, labs, labs that are of clinical significance um, can be reported as an adverse event. You also want to follow up on labs if you want to be rechecking them um, based on good, good um, clinical judgment. Um, protocol deviations are, are really important. You want to make sure that you're tracking things that will, and this will be outlined in your, in your protocol, um, but things that affect patient safety. So if you're missing visits or missing assessments, um, if you do not enroll someone that meets the inclusion or exclusion criteria, or if a participant is taking a, a concomitant medication um, that might have a, um, an interaction with an investigational product, um, you, need to, you need to note that you've done that. Um, again, protocol deviations are ways of just tracking what has been done. Um, it's not a way to, to say anyone's done something wrong, but we need to know that you've deviated from the protocol, um, and regulatory agencies will need to know that as well, including your IRB. Um, we also want to note things that might affect trial integrity. Um, so if, you know, if, if we're looking at, at a drug being approved eventually, we want to make sure that the trial, the integrity of the trial can be really impacted by protocol deviations. So typically you would keep a, a log of, of any protocol deviations for any trial. Next slide. So now we're going to move on to close out. So you've had, um, your site's been activated, you've been selected, you're activated, you've enrolled patients, you've done all the follow-up, um, and now you're in study close out. So next slide is to keep calm because it's not done yet. There's a lot that happens during study closeout. So next slide. Um, so one of the important things is to think about adequate um, record keeping and retention. So making sure that you um, have records of all the drugs that's been dispensed um, and the fate of any unused drugs. Um, you want your case histories, so your source documentation and your case report forms and all of your supporting documentation for the trial the consent forms the medical records, your regulatory binders to show that everyone at your site um, has, was trained and qualified to, to, um, um, to, to perform their duties on the, on the trial. Um, all of those need to be in really good shape and ready for an audit, potentially. Um, and then you need to retain your records. And typically, from a regulatory standpoint, we say when a new drug application is approved, um, you need to keep your records for two years after that happens. So, as Dixie said in one of her earlier slides, it takes a long time for a company to file a new drug application. Um, so, basically, you want to keep your records on file until a sponsor tells you that you do not need to keep them on file anymore or that you can ship it to, to the sponsor. Next slide. So, just a few take-home messages um, that I want to share. So, site investigators, you really take on the overall responsibility of the rights safety and welfare of the study participants. Um, the tasks can be delegated to qualified individuals with, with appropriate supervision, but remembering that responsibility cannot be delegated. Um, another important point is, as I said earlier, if it's not documented, it never happened. Um, always remembering that safety comes first. Um, and as with anything, making sure that you maintain good communication with you know, within your site, with your site staff, with your IRB, your study monitor, the trial sponsor, um, anyone really involved in the study, you want to have good communication. And the last, so the next slide, um, is, is just a, a cautionary tale of sort of what happens when an investigator doesn't follow these guidelines and regulations. So basically, you know, our participants are really placed in jeopardy or potentially even, you know, harmed. Um, the public gains distrust of clinical research, which none of us want. Um, investigators, you know, can, can have restrictions by, by the FDA put on them. They can even be, you know, uh, debarred from participating in clinical research studies. That's in, in severe cases. Um, institutions, you know, have been, have lost their federal-wide assurance. They can lose, you know, federal funds if they're not properly um, overseeing clinical research at their institutions. So this is sometimes why your IRB may seem like they're being tough with you, but they're really doing it to protect you and everyone else at your institution that's doing research. Um, and ultimately, when, they're, when the FDA comes to audit your site, they can issue a, a Form 483, which is basically a warning 
and that is issued to you as the investigator. You who signed the FDA Form 1572, you will have that on your record that you conducted a, um, a study and the FDA found major um, compliance issues with it. So that's why it's really important to make sure that you do follow good clinical practice guidelines and remember our take home messages. So the last slide is just sort of a bit of a cartoon about sort of the perceptions um, versus the reality of research. So in the middle of this slide, we have a, a cup that has some liquid in it, um, and you can read around, but uh, here we find this fun. The marketing group definitely sees the glass is half full. The legal sees the glass is half empty. The engineer thinks that the glass is too big, um, so it needs to modify the protocol. The investigator wants to know how much water did all the other PIs get. Um, the participants or the subjects really want to know if there's placebo or a drug in the glass. Um, the IRB, this is classic, the IRB sees the glass as vulnerable <laughs> and in need of special protection. Um, the FDA uh, said the glass is not, does not meet regulation. It has to be resubmitted with a handle. Um, the coordinator just wants to know if they have to report it to the IRB. Um, the media has reported that the glass is broken. Um, the accountant is assuring the stakeholders that the glass is definitely full. Um, and the public has no idea there even is a glass. So um, take that as, as kind of a, a fun ending. 